Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God. I'd like to talk about Daniel chapter 11, Jews and Jesus. Now, this is somewhat of a follow-up to a sermon we did about why Jews don't accept Jesus. Now, we ended that particular sermon talking about the fact that the temple was destroyed. The Bible has reasons. talks about temple destruction. But the Jews came up with their own reasons. Actually, they come up with all kinds of reasons why they don't accept Jesus as the Messiah. And if they would actually pay closer attention to the Bible, the Hebrew Scriptures, as well as some of their own writings, what they would find, if they connect them correctly, is that Jesus is the Messiah. I'm going to go through some of the Jewish arguments against Jesus to be the Messiah, but actually, many of them actually do point to Jesus being the Messiah. And we all need to know that Jesus is the Messiah, uh, we have a book called Proof Jesus is the Messiah. And in a sense, this is a, well, actually the sixth direct sermon uh, related to this book that we've been going through. Well, this book, as I held up for a second, like all of our books, is available at uh, www.ccog.org website. Click on the literature tab, go under books and booklets, and you'll find it. And it's online, you can just have it. Well, anyway, according to the Jewish Talmud, which is a uh, compiled in the Babylonian area, era uh, 200 to 500 or so uh, AD, they give reasons why the temple was destroyed. Now, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Now, the reasons were there was Jewish disobedience regarding the Sabbath, there were too many drinking parties, they weren't properly teaching their children, there were just not enough trustworthy Jews, and that Jews were disparaging Torah scholars. Now, they didn't seem to tie in the destruction, at least what I've read, and I'm sure some of them did, the destruction of the temple to Daniel 9, 20, uh, 6 and 7, which is when it's actually predicted. They quoted some scriptures, but this wasn't part of it. Now, let's look at, I'm going to read from the Talmud. This is from Shabbat uh, 119b, that discusses some of the Jewish reasons why the temple was destroyed. And this all ties in, again, with Daniel chapter 9 and some other things that people don't understand or they, they should understand because I believe it clearly proves Jesus is the Messiah. Anyway, here's what the Talmud says. Rabbi Yehuda said, Jerusalem was destroyed only because they disparaged the, score t the Torah scholars in it. As is stated, they mocked the messengers of God and disdained his words and taunted his prophets until the wrath of God arose against his people until it could be healed. And that's a reference to 2 Chronicles 36, 16. What's the meaning of until it could not be healed? Rav Huda says that Rav said, it means that anyone who disparages Torah scholars cannot be healed from his wound. Rav Huda said that Rav said, What's the meaning of that which is written? Do not touch my anointed ones and do not and do my prophets no harm. Second Chronicles 16:22. Do not touch my anointed ones. These are the school children who are precious and important as the kings and the priests. And do not harm my prophets. These are the Torah scholars. Now this is from the Jewish Talmud. This is, you know, their interpretation of the Bible. Now, despite this rabbinical interpretation, the Old Testament does not say the destruction of the temple would come because of rejection of Jewish Torah scholars. The type of Torah scholars the Talmud referred to were not directly sent by God, nor were they God's prophets. Now, if those citing the Talmud had been more accepting of the literal meaning of the Hebrew scriptures, they could have easily seen this. Now, you know, I should comment that the New Testament clearly shows that the Jews did taunt God's anointed prophets, like John the Baptist, Jesus, and Paul. Early Jewish writings also show that they taunted early Christians, which particularly Jewish converts, they called minim. So, Tamudic uh, scholars should have had a clue that the Jewish rejection of Jesus and others was part of the reason for the destruction of the temple. Now, I'd like to look at another rabbinical view. This is from something called Yoma 9b. I'm going to read it twice. This is from the Talmud also. And the reason I'm going to the Talmud so much is because this is a Jewish interpretation of scriptures and what they think things mean. And I'm trying to point out that if they would look at these in light of the Bible, they would see that Jesus is Messiah. You say, well, you're not, you may not be Jewish and you don't care. We're going to go through some more specific details 
about why Jesus is the Messiah from the Bible. And you might say, well, you already think Jesus is the Messiah. Well, that's good. We want you to be more certain about it. We want you to be ready because there's Jews who are against Jesus and they'll tell you why this stuff doesn't matter or they don't think it's important. As a Christian, we're supposed to be able to give an answer or a defense for the hope that lies within us. And, and if you learn from what we're saying and teaching here, this should be able to help you provide some of those answers. Anyway, from Yoma 9b, it says, Why was the second temple destroyed? It was destroyed due to the fact there was wanted hatred, wanton hatred during the period. Now, that's one translation, but I'm going to read another Jewish translation. It says, Why was the second sanctuary destroyed? Seeing that in its time they were occupying themselves with the Torah, precepts, and the practice of charity, because therein prevailed hatred without cause. So the Talmud said that the temple was destroyed because there was hatred without cause. Let's go to the book of John, John chapter 15. And when I'm reading from the New Testament, I'm tending to be, be reading from the New New King James Version of the Bible. John 15, starting in verse 24. Jesus said, If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my Father. Verse 25. But this happened, the word might be fulfilled which is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. And... So, uh, it's interesting that the Talmud said the temple was destroyed because they, had, they hated without a cause. Well, the Talmud should have said they hated Jesus without a cause. And that would have helped them understand better, but they don't seem to get it. Now, Christians say that the Messiah came right on time based upon what's written in Daniel chapter 9. And that the temple destruction helps prove this. Now, the view for the rabbis tends to be that Jesus didn't come when he was expected to come because of Jewish sins. Yet, the Jewish should, Jews should consider that the destruction of the temple left them without a biblically national way of atonement. The temple was destroyed, and after that they quit doing animal sacrifices. You know from the first five books of the Bible, particularly uh, uh, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, that animal sacrifices were something that they were supposed to be doing, and they don't have the temple system anymore. The reality is this should have impacted the Jews more than, than I think it did. Now I'd like to read something from the Talmud. This is related to Zechariah 9.9. It says, Rabbi Alexandri explains, If the Jewish people merit redemption, the Messiah will come in a miraculous manner in the clouds of heaven. If they do not measure redemption, the Messiah will come lowly in riding on a donkey. Well, in John 12, 15, you don't have to go there. We see that Jesus came lowly uh, riding on a donkey. Now think about it. Does it, it make more sense that instead of thinking that Jewish problems prevented the Messiah from coming, to instead believe that the Messiah came and they didn't pay attention? Now, as far as uh, the Messiah coming in the clouds of heaven, if you want, you can go to the book of Matthew. Matthew 24, Jesus said, when he comes the next time, that's what we're going to see. Matthew 24, verse 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. And most of you probably are aware that the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, uh, talked about this as well. Jesus is going to come in the clouds, but it, but the first time he was supposed to come on a donkey, and he did. In previous sermons, we went through over 200 Hebrew scriptures that the New Testament shows that Jesus filled or fulfilled somehow. And again, they're all in this free book, Proof Jesus is the Messiah. Now, as far as the temple goes and its destruction and Jesus' timing, let's go to the book of John. This, is good. this should help you understand some of what's going on uh, with this, because this all kind of fits. Well, it all does fit. Hopefully I can explain it clear enough so you'd know that it clearly fits. John 2, starting uh, verse 13. 
Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. We made a whip of cords, he drove them out, all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. He said to those who sold doves, Take these things away, do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? So after Jesus did this, they wanted some kind of a sign. Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it, I'll raise it up. The Jews said, it took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he was, had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them. They believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had said. Now, this actually gives us a few points about the timing of Jesus' ministry. And we can connect this with historical accounts that are outside the Bible. Now, the first century historian, Jewish historian Josephus wrote, And now Herod, in the 18th year of his reign, after certain acts, undertook a very great work, that is, to build himself the temple of God and make it larger in compass and to raise it to a most magnificent altitude as esteeming it to be the most glorious of all his actions, as it really was, to bring it to perfection and that this would be sufficient for an everlasting memorial of him. Now, let me comment for a second or two. The temple was actually destroyed centuries before and in Ezra and Nehemiah's time, they started to rebuild it. But when they rebuilt the second temple, it wasn't quite as fancy, etc. And Herod, centuries later, did that. Now, I'll explain how this ties in in just a moment. Now, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, Herod the Great was a Roman-appointed king of Judea around 37, the year 37 B.C. or B.C.E. And... According to the Jewish Encyclopedia of 1906, it was only in the spring of the year 37 that Herod, assisted by a large Roman force under the command of Sius Sosius, laid siege to Jerusalem. And after a siege of several months, Jerusalem fell, probably in July, into the hands of the Romans. Now, the 18th year of Herod's reign would be from about mid-20 to mid-19 B.C., Remember, Josephus said that it was the 18th year of his reign he began to rebuild the temple. Now, if you add the 46 years that the Jews mentioned in building the temple in John 2, verse 20, to 19 B.C., plus you have to add a year for the skipped year zero between where you switch from B.C. to A.D., you get to a date of 28 A.D. This would be the first Passover of Jesus' three-and-a-half-year ministry, which he began when he was around 30. Three years later, he'd returned to cleanse the temple for the second time, just prior to his death, in uh, probably 31, could be 30 A.D. Uh, it's 30 if 20 B.C. should be used. 31 if 19 B.C. is the right time. So we see the timing of Jesus' coming here is, is consistent. Now, there's something in the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 6, verse 2. Now, I'm going to read this from the Jewish uh, Publication Society version of the Bible. Mainly so any Jews who watch this will not believe that this translation was influenced by Christians. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his presence. Now, there's been... Christian and other commentators have their own opinions of what this means. We're going to skip that because I want to focus on how the Jews have interpreted this and some other uh, scriptures because actually it ties into Jesus' coming. This is from uh, the, the Babylonian Talmud, the track 8, Sanhedrin, folio 97a and b. Rabbi Katina said, 6,000 years shall the world exist and 1,000 to 7th, it shall be desolate. And, as it is written, the Lord alone will be exalted in that day, which is a reference to Isaiah 2, verse 11. A rabbi named Abaye said, it will be desolate 2,000, as it said, after two days he will revive us, the third day he will raise us up, and we will live in his sight, Hosea 6, 2, which I just read. 
It's been taught in accordance with Rabbi Katina, just as the seventh year is one year of release in seven, so the world, 1,000 years out of seven, shall be fallow, as is written. The Lord is alone shall be exalted in that day. And it's further said, a psalm and a song for the Sabbath day, Psalm 92.1, meaning the day that is altogether a Sabbath, and it's also said for a thousand years in the sight is but as yesterday when it's passed. But before I finish that section of the Babylonian Talmud, let me make a few comments. What they're basically saying is that God's got a 7,000 year plan. A day is like a thousand years. The seventh year is a, will be the millennium, time for the land to, to rest. In the Old Testament, they had a land s Sabbath. Every seven years, you weren't supposed to plow your field. You're supposed to let it lay fallow, it lay by itself. Uh, basically, it would help the soil replenish itself and get nutrients and all whatever. But God said to do that. And the r rabbinical interpretation is this is also related to um, God's plan and a, a millennial reign. Now, going back to the Jewish writings, it says, the Tana Debe Elihu, which means actually the school of Elijah, this is believed to have been started by Elijah the prophet, teaches the world is to exist 6,000 years. In the first 2,000 years there was desolation. 2,000 years the Torah flourished. The next 2,000 years is the Messianic era. But through our many iniquities, all these years have been lost. Okay, well that's essentially a Jewish interpretation. It's God's got a 6,000, 7,000 year plan. And it's the three days in Hosea each represent 2,000 years each. Now, tradition, Jewish tradition says that the prophet Elijah spoke about this. Now, what's interesting, though, is the Talmudic comments support the idea that the Messiah was supposed to come 4,000 years after Adam and Eve were put out of the Garden of Eden, or when they were created. It's also supportive of the idea that the New Testament has in Revelation 20, verses 4 to 6, that the, uh, there'll be a millennial time period that comes. Now, since the New Testament shows that Jesus was born during the reign of Herod, you read that in Matthew uh, 2, verse 1, and he was about 30 years of age when he started his ministry, which you can see in Luke 3.23, his ministry started basically when the 4,000 years ended. Therefore, he fulfilled a messianic understanding the Jews had about when the Messiah was supposed to come. Now, the sins of the Jews did not prevent the Messiah from coming. What the sins of the Jews prevented, if you will, is the Jews recognizing the Messiah came. Now, I'm not going to read this, but if you look at uh, Isaiah 59, uh, 2 and, and 11, as well as Deuteronomy 32, 5 and 28, you compare those two scriptures to each other, you'll see that that's consistent with what the Bible says, that they won't understand because, because of their sins. But not that God's plan changed because of their sins. That they don't, they would, they don't understand. Now, what the Talmud calls the Messianic era, we this is something we in the Continuing Church of God would call the Messianic Age, which began around 27 A.D. or the Church Age, uh, which began around 31 A.D. And it's lasted about 2,000 years since Jesus arrived, and He came when He was supposed to arrive. Now, as far as the first 2,000 years. This seems to be a calculation or an estimation from the time of Adam and Eve were created until the birth of Abram, who became Abraham. Again, I'm using the Jewish interpretation from the Talmud. 2,000 years for desolation, then 2,000 years the Torah, then 2,000 years the Messianic Age. Now, the first five books, called and called the Torah, were not written until about 500 years after the birth of Abram. But it looks like we really have to start, if that Jewish interpretation is at all correct, we have to pick some kind of a date for this 2,000 years to have started as far as the Torah time. Now, according to a Jewish rabbi, by the name of uh, Yisachar Frond, he said that the second 2,000 year period began during the time of Abram uh, or Abraham. So, not, not all Jewish authorities or scholars think that the 2,000 years were lost because of the Jewish iniquities. Now, if the Great Flood, the Noah Flood, 
came around the year 1656, this would be 1656 years after uh, Adam and Eve uh, were either created or after they left the Garden of Eden. Uh, then uh, Abraham was probably, and that equates to around 2325 BC, by the way. That means that Abraham was born somewhere around the year 2008, not BC or AD. AD. Jews have something called Anno Mundi, from the age of the world or whatever. And again, starting from either the time Adam and Eve were created or after they uh, left the Garden of Eden. And if there were no begettal date issues or uh, solar date issues, then we probably figured that Abraham probably came around that time. Uh, however, when you try to figure out the age of the world, you look in the Old Testament and you see this guy begat, this guy begat, this guy begat, this guy. And if you look, for example, in Genesis 5 and Genesis 11, there's 19 sons. And it's not likely that all 19 were born on the same calendar date as all the rest of them. So this gives you kind of a counting issue. Also, the way uh, the ancients counted birthdays, sometimes it would be the first moon of, of, uh, of the spring or uh, the first moon of the fall. And so their, their birthdays were done that way. And because of that, uh, you end up kind of a, an overcounting, if you will. And this would tend to point, therefore, at a, I'm not going to go into a lot of statistics, but let's say a random distribution be the term I should use, you kind of get to the point where then uh, Abraham was probably uh, born around the year uh, uh, 2000 AM or, or 2001 AM, which would be around 1974 BC. So Hosea's statement, on the third day he'll raise us up that we may live in his present. Now that's presence, that's consistent, by the way, with the first resurrection. What do you mean that? Because uh, after 6,000 years, Jesus will come, uh, the dead will be raised. I alluded to this uh, with 1 Thessalonians 4.16. You can also read about this in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, also in Revelation chapter 20. This involves uh, Christians. So you've got, interestingly, as far as I'm concerned, a rabbinical interpretation of Hosea chapter 6, verse 2. That at 2,000 years, a time of desolation. That's before, uh, well, the flood happened, etc. Uh, Adam, Adam and Eve sinned, etc. And then you've got Abram coming at the end of that 2,000 years. Then you've got Jesus coming, or starting his ministry, at the end of that 2,000 years. And then the Messianic age, or the church age, from then to present. Which, again, is consistent with at least one rabbinical interpretation. Now, Jesus came when he was supposed to come. It didn't, not, he did not not come because of Jews' sins, but because of Jewish sins, they haven't recognized him. Now, there's at least two Jewish sources, by the way, that say that the Messiah is going to come during the time the Romans were uh, over uh, Israel, or Jew, Jerusalem. Now, the first that I found came from something called the Jerusalem Targum. Now, this was written probably late 1st century uh, second, sometimes 2nd century A.D., but some believe it actually originally came from B.C. And here's what it says. Moses came forth from the midst of the desert, but the king Messiah comes from the midst of Rome. Okay, so this is a prophecy that the Messiah, or an interpretation of Scripture that the Jews, some of the Jews had, the Messiah would come during the time of Rome, and Jesus certainly came during the time of Rome. Now the second is from the Talmud, and again, even though the Talmud was not finalized and probably until around, around 500 A.D., many of its teachings supposedly came from many centuries prior, including to time uh, prior to Jesus' coming. So this is uh, from Sanhedrin 98b. Rav says, The son of David, the Messiah, Jesus was the son of David, will not come until the evil Roman kingdom will disperse throughout Israel for nine months, while well, they were there longer, as is stated. Therefore, he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth, then the remnant of his brethren shall return with the children of Israel. That's a reference to Micah uh, 5, uh, 2, 3. Once a period equivalent to a term of pregnancy passes, the redemption will come. 
Well, the amount of time isn't quite the, the case, but according to the Bible, like say, for example, John 11:48, as well as Jewish and other historical sources, they clearly say the time Jesus was here was a time when the Romans controlled Israel. So it's another reason the Jews should give credence to the view that Jesus is Messiah. Now, I entitled this sermon, Daniel 9, Jews and Jesus, and I haven't talked too much about Daniel 9. Why don't you go to Daniel chapter 9? I'm going to read a fair amount from this. Now, Daniel 9 has been used by various ones claiming Christianity as proof Jesus is the Messiah, numeric proof, and I believe it's strong proof, and many of them do as well. One of the reasons why it's considered proof is that Christians didn't write the book of Daniel, and Jew Christians feel, like such as myself, feel that Jews, since Jews accept the book of Daniel, they should accept what it says, and it points to Jesus being the Messiah. Let's go to verse 24 of Daniel chapter 9. Now I'm going to be reading again from the Jewish Publication Society translation of the Hebrew Scriptures, but it will d differ a little from what you, yours probably has, but it's, the concept is still there. The specifics, there's enough specifics still in here. So 70 weeks are decreed upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish their transgression and to make an end of sin and to forgive iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal vision and prophet, this is the prophet, P-R-O-P-H-E-T, and to anoint the most holy place. Verse 25, Know therefore and discern that from the going forth of the word to restore and build Jerusalem unto one anointed, a prince shall be seven weeks, and for three score and two weeks it shall be built again with a broad place and moat, but in troublous times. These are considered to be weeks of years, not literal weeks. And after three score and two weeks shall an anointed one be cut off and be no more. And the prince of the people that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, but his end will be with a flood. And until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Now, how's that proof of Jesus' Messiahship? Well, it shows that the Messiah was clearly supposed to come before the temple was destroyed. Now, some Jews want to say this was not a reference to the Messiah, but it was. Um, now, I'm, I'm just, assert, just asserting that. I'm going to give some Jewish reasons to consider this. For example, if you look at the complete Jewish Bible, I'm going to reread Daniel 9.26. Then, after the 62 weeks, Mishiach, which means Messiah, will be cut off and have nothing. And this is capitalized here, this M for Mishiach. The people of the prince... Yet the come will destroy the city and sanctuary, but his end will come to the flood, and desolations are decreed until the war is over. The Messiah had to come before the temple was destroyed. If not, the Bible is not true, and so the Jews should consider the ramifications of Daniel 9.26. Now, furthermore, the prophecy of Daniel 9.24 ties the timing of the, the, the anointed one, the Meshach, the Messiah, it, in verse 26, do a decree. Now, this is a decree from Ezra, chapter 7, verses 12 through 26, which we'll get to later. Daniel also mentions that Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt, and that happened, as we can see in the book of Nehemiah. But Daniel 9.25 says that after the cutting off of the anointed one, the city of Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, and the sanctuary, the temple, will be destroyed as well. And this is destroyed by the Roman general Titus in 70 A.D., now, in the continuing Church of God, we've taught that Jesus was resurrected in 31 A.D., or possibly 30 A.D. This is basically based upon, partially based upon the day the, human, the Hebrew calendar that Jesus took his last Passover, plus outside confirmation regarding the darkness that happened per Matthew 24, me, Matthew 27, 45, Mark 15, 33, and Luke 23, 45. And I covered that in a previous sermon. But the reality is the temple was destroyed after the Messiah came. Therefore, the Messiah had to have already come. Now, I want to go to an interpretation of Daniel chapter 9 from the old Radio Church of God. This came from a Plain Truth magazine article 
in April 1962, written by uh, the late David John Hill. He wrote, At the time of Jesus' life on this earth, Herod, the king of Judea, the wise men from the nations of the east, many of the priests, scribes, and elders, as well as common people, realized that the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel 9 was nearing its completion. The Messiah, the prince, was eagerly looked forward to, to free them from the yoke of Roman oppression. The Messiah was expected because of an understanding of the prophecy. But he was misunderstood when he appeared in the fulfillment of this prophecy because they refused to recognize the first portion of the prophecy and hung on only to the last portion. Now what he's referring to there is going to Daniel 9, uh, uh, 20, uh, 26. After uh, three score and 20 weeks, the anointing would be cut off. So they, they were not looking at the right, just the right thing. Getting back to the article from the Radio Church of God, here very plainly is listed the exact time which the prophesied Messiah would appear to be to begin to do the work mentioned in verse 24. The command to restore and rebuild the Jerusalem was given by Artaxerxes in 457 B.C. Much of the book of Ezra and the entire book of Nehemiah cover this particular event. Seventy weeks and six Three score and two weeks equals 69 weeks. So the prophecy showed that from the going forth, the command to rebuild Jerusalem in 457 B.C., it would be 483 years until the appearance of the prophesied Messiah to begin fulfilling the works of verse 24. As I say, many of the Jews uh, notice about uh, verse 24 about this idea about everlasting righteousness, but they skip some of the other parts here. Now, if you add 483 to the year 457 B.C., that brings you to the year 27 A.D., because there's no year zero between B.C. and A.D. Now, that begins at the time Jesus began his ministry, apparently in the fall of the year. His ministry is believed to last for three and a half years. Uh, hence, uh, uh, the veil that was torn, that I referred to in a previous sermon, would have been torn probably in the spring of 31 A.D., now, the ministry of Jesus, as well as the subsequent destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, is consistent with the prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. Now, based on that timing, one would think, oh, well, the Jews will accept Jesus. But that's generally not the case. I'm going to read something from an article posted at a group called Jews for Judaism. Not to be confused with Jews for Jesus. Jews for Judaism. This is what they claim. Christians base their understanding with a belief that the starting point of the prophecy begins at 444 BCE with a decree issued by King Xerxes, Ezra 7, 11 through 16. 69 weeks, 483 years, would bring you to 39 CE, or which we call AD. This is seven years off from the commonly accepted date of 32 CE, being the year that Jesus was put to death. The seven-year discrepancy is revolved by Christian theologians who redefined the definition of a year. They claim prophecies like Daniel would be understood in the prophetic years have 360 days rather than 365 and a quarter. Now that's the claim from Jews for Judaism. There's two problems with that. While some Protestants may have used 44 B.C. as their starting point, the ascension year for, for King Xerxes began in 464 B.C., which places the seventh year from 458 to 457. And so if you do use the 365 and a quarter day year, you'll arrive at 2627 A.D. So this Jews for Judaism article argument is in error. And again, it does point to the right time. And, you know, I should comment, if the Jews for Judaism people just thought we were off of seven years, they could have done some recalculations, because they should realize, even if it was 39 the year 39 when Jesus was, was executed, and I believe it was more like 3031. But even if it was as late as 39, it still was before the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So you should think about that. Well, anyway, let's go to uh, Ezra. I'm going to uh, not read all of it, but let's go to Ezra 7, verse 7 and 8. And there went up some children of Israel, and the priests and the Levites and singers and the porters, and the 
Nethanim unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes, the king. And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was the seventh year of the king. And we talked about the seventh year of the king just a moment ago. Now let's get down to verse 11. And again, I'm reading this from the Jewish Publication Society uh, translation of the Bible. Now, this is the copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra the priest, the scribe, even the scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. Verse 12. Artaxerxes, king of kings, unto Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of, of, God, of the God of heaven, and so forth. And now I make a decree that all they, the people of Israel and their priests and the Levites in my realm are that are minded their own free will go with thee to Jerusalem. Go. Now I'll skip down to uh, verse 25. Again, I'm skipping some verses just for time's sake. And thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God who is in thy hand, appoint magistrates and judges who may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach ye him that knoweth them not. And whosoever will not do the law of thy God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed upon him with all diligence, whether it be unto death or to banishment or to confiscation of goods or to imprisonment. Verse 27. Blessed be the eternal of the Lord, Yahweh, the God of our fathers, who has put such a thing as this in the king's heart to beautify the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. Now, the two main Jewish arguments against the timing seem to be which decree, by whom and when, and that the anointed one doesn't have to be the Messiah. And I checked with various Jewish sources to come up with that. However, if you accept the decree in Ezra 7, and Daniel 9 is referring to the Messiah as the anointed one, which it does in the complete Jewish Bible and other sources, all should accept that Jesus fulfilled the timing of that. Now, according to a Jewish writer by the name of Abba Hillel Silver, many Jews did expect the Messiah in the first century. And I'm reading from a book called The History of the Messianic Speculation in Israel. It was written in 1927. And this is pages 4 and 5. The book of Daniel, the one canonized apocalyptic track out of many which were widely circulated, and held in high regard by the people, dwelt upon the mystery of the end of days. Prior to the first century, messianic interest was not excessive. That's right, because if you look at Daniel, you'll get to the first cent what we now call the first century. The first century, according to this Jewish writer, witnessed a remarkable outburst of messianic emotionalism. Well, yeah, if you believe the book of Daniel and you add up all the numbers and take it, from, take it from an Xerxes decree, you would get to the time of Jesus. That would be the, what we now call the first century. So if people truly believed, yeah, you'd expect it. I wouldn't call it necessarily emotionalism, but they, people would be emotional about the truth. Anyway, this Jewish writing continues. This is to be attributed to the prevalent belief induced by the popular chronology of that day. Right, they knew when certain things happened, so they added numbers up, and this is where they got so there was a lot of Jewish speculation that Jesus, excuse me, that the Messiah would come in the first, what we now call the first century A.D. Now, is that the only source you can look at? No, there's other Jewish sources that recognize this in, in another way. That Daniel 9 is a messianic prophecy. Now, there's somebody by the name of Shlomo Yitzchaki, and he's known as Rashi, R-A-S-H-I which is kind of a combination of the name Rabbi Shlomo ben Isaac. And he's a very prominent Jewish authority of the uh, 11th century. And here's what he wrote about Daniel uh, 9, 24, and 26. Seventy weeks of years have been decreed on Jerusalem from the first day of the destruction of the, in the days of Zedekiah until it be destroyed the second time to terminate the transgression and to end sin, so that Israel should receive their complete retribution in the exile of Titus and his subjugation. Remember, Titus came in 70 A.D. In order that their transgression should, be, should terminate, their sin should end, and their iniquity should be expiated. In order to bring upon them the eternal righteousness and anoint upon them the Holy of Holies, the ark, the altars, and the holy vessels, 
which they will bring to them through the King Messiah. The number of seven weeks is 490 years. The Babylonian exile was 70 years. The second temple stood for 420 years. Again, according to this Jewish rabbi known as Rashi. And after those weeks, the anointed one will be cut off. Get this. Agrippa, the king of Judea, who is ruling at the time of the destruction, will be slain and will be no more. And he will not have. Now again, this is Rashi's interpretation of Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 and 26. The meaning, according to him, is that he will not be the anointed one. This is purely an expression of the prince and the dignitary in the city of the sanctuary and the city and the holy people and the people of the, people of the coming monarch will destroy. The monarch will come upon them. That is Titus and his armies. So Rashi actually admitted that Daniel 9 was a messianic prophecy that was fulfilled about the time of Jesus. Now, this Herod he's referring to, Herod Agrippa, well, this Herod Marcus Julius Agrippa, now he was a king of Judea, Judah from around 27 AD, basically the same time Jesus started his ministry. So if the timing of Agrippa is right, like Rashi wrote that it was, obviously the timing of Jesus would be right. Because again, we're pointing to 27 AD, which is again when we tend to believe that Jesus started his ministry. Now, as far as this Agrippa guy goes, the Jews revolted against him later in 66, and he helped the Romans and their general Titus to conquer Jerusalem. And Agrippa was actually rewarded for his efforts in helping the Romans, and he lived and reigned decades after the fall of Jerusalem. He was not the anointed king Messiah, and he wasn't cut off. Now, as far as, as, far as Rashi goes, apparently his reason for the Messiahship going to Agrippa was because of Israel's sins. Rashi also declared, after 2,000 years of Torah, and remember, now that ties back to Hosea 6 too, the interpretation that the, some Jews had, first 2,000 years of desolation, then 2,000 years of Torah, that's starting from Abram until the Messiah. So, so after 2,000 years of Torah, it was God's decree that the Messiah would come. And a wicked generation would come to an end and the subjugation of Israel would be destroyed. Now yet, consider that Jesus did come at the right time, and the temple was afterwards destroyed, as it was prophesied in the book of Daniel, chapter 9. Consider further that Abraham Abin Ezra, from 1092 to 1167, that's when he lived, apparently, who's considered one of the most distinguished Jewish biblical commentators in the Middle Ages, he also taught, quote, Daniel leads up to Titus, and the destruction. So there are prominent Jewish authorities who have agreed that the timing of Daniel chapter 9 clearly points to the time of Jesus. And it's because it does. Yet, yeah, why don't we read this next part? This is from the Talmud. This is from this is a Sanhedrin 97b. This is this part. Talk about Torah scholars, etc. The Messiah will not come in accordance with the opinion of our rabbis. What they wrote. Of course, if you're not going to come in the opinion of their rabbis, the Messiah comes according to Scripture and God's plans. And now, the reason they wrote this, the Messiah won't come in accordance with their rabbis is one, pointing to the time of Jesus, is also pointing to somebody else. Uh, the Jews thought somebody else could have been the Messiah that came later, and I'll get to that later. Now, Jews should have accepted the chronology, if you will, the common chronology, as it's called sometimes, that Daniel 9 pointed to the time of Jesus, the Messiah. Because there's no doubt about the time the temple was destroyed. It's a matter of history, record. We know that happened. But the Jews changed the common chronology. They changed how old the world, world was, etc. Um, according to uh, the Jewish, current Jewish thought, the year that starts in late uh, 2018, that year that started a few months back, is 5779. It's the year that I'm speaking now. 
according to them. Now that's not correct, but that's what they call it. Now it's been speculated that Jewish leaders changed the year on purpose in the early 2nd century to discount arguments that the Christians had that Daniel 9.25 pointed to Jesus as the Messiah, number one. And number two, to make the Daniel 9.25 prophecy point to somebody called uh, Simon bar -Koba. Now there's this, a document called the Cedar Olam Rabbah. It's from the 2nd century, AD, BC, uh, AD, which the Jews call CE, Common Era. Uh, and it tries to detail how many years are from uh, the time of creation till present. Now many Jewish scholars have seen errors in this, and they have actually admitted that one of the reasons that the errors are there on purpose was so you couldn't tie, so Jews wouldn't tie Daniel 9, 25 to when Jesus came, or uh, Christians shouldn't supposedly use it. Now, according to a lawyer, uh, an, an Orthodox Jew by the name of uh, Michael First, some modern Jewish scholars have seen this as well. I'm going to mention some of their names. Chaim Shively, Benny Isaacson, Ben Zion Wachholder, Jay Braverman, Joseph Tabori, Henry Guggenheimer uh, have tended to admit this, and also Beryl Wine is said, said to admit, quote, the Jewish way of counting is off 166 years, whereas Samuel Hockelhin admitted the Jewish sages provided an incorrect chronology to accurately predict the time of coming of Messiah. So they did it on purpose. Now, I'd like to read something from a Jewish scientist by the name of Saul Kluk. According to the Cedar Olam Rabbah, in our current Hebrew calendar, the destruction of the first temple took place in 442 BCE. This means the Cedar Olam Rabbah and our current Hebrew calendar are out of sync with modern historical records concerning the destruction of the temple. It introduces a difference of 164 years in relation to the scholarly counting for past historical events. And there have been other ones who have who've said this. People on purpose did this. And throughout history, from the uh, 8th or 15th century, this whole, I'm not going to list all their names again. Uh, they're all in our book, Proof Jesus the Messiah, a bunch of these names of Jewish scholars who said, look, the, the year we're saying it is, it's not. Now, why did this happen? Well, one person was a rabbi by the name of Akiva. And he's the one that, in my view, caused all kinds of problems. He caused a zillion people to die. He did all kinds of horrible... He, he's considered a great scholar, but I think what he did was terrible and horrible. And I, when we get done with this, I think you will as well. He believed so much that uh, the Messiah had to come, and he'd be this guy that he ended up calling Bar Kokhba, that he had to make a change in the chronology, and that's why people follow it now. Okay, I'm going to read something related to him in the Talmud. This is from Jerusalem Tanet 4.5. It says, Rabbi Shimon ben Yohai taught, Rabbi Akiva would expound, a star has risen from Jacob. Well, the star was for Jesus, and it was before a century, over a century before then, but okay. Anyway, it says, Kozba, Bar Kokhba, has risen from Jacob. When Rabbi Akiva would see Bar Kozba, he would say, This is the anointed king, the Messiah. Rabbi Yohanan ben Torta said to him, Akiva, grass will sprout from your cheeks, and still the Messiah will not arrive. Of course, Bar Kokhba was not the Messiah, but because they believed he did, they changed their counting system. They absolutely came to completely change it by over a century, I think close to around about two centuries, but I'm not going to go into all that detail now. But one Jewish source says, the sages called him not Bar Kokhba, this is Bar Kokhba, son of the star, but Bar Kozaba, the son of a lie. But his real name was neither. It was Bar Kosiba. So, Anyway, the other part I want to go in here is as follows. And this is uh, from this is going to be from the Annals of the World, 
It says, Bar Kokhba had been declared to be the long-awaited Messiah by the foremost Jewish scholar of the day, the highly rene- venerated Rabbi Akiva or Akiba ben Joseph. And amongst the many accolades that were laid upon him, to be preeminent, he was a father of the Mishnah, supposedly. Such prominence gave great weight to the messianic expectation that Akiva placed upon Bar Kokhba. Akiva's students became some of the most prominent sages of the following generation. By removing 164 or 65 years from the duration of the Persian Empire, Rabbi Halafta was able to make 483 year from Daniel 9, 24, 27 prophecy fall reasonably close to the years prior to 132 AD. The revolt which Bar Kokhba rose to prominence as Israel's military and economic leader. Then with Akiva proclaiming he's the King Messiah, followed by all the contemporary sages regarding him as the King Messiah, so all the top Jewish leaders at the time, or many of them, did this, the Jewish populace got around this false hope. So a century after rejecting Jesus, the Jews improperly accepted Simon Bar Kokhba as their Messiah, partially based upon an erroneous pronouncement, an intentional miscalculation from a rabbi. Now, unlike uh, Jesus, Simon Bar Kokhba was militaristic. Cassiodea claimed that 400, excuse me, 580,000 Jews were slaughtered and more died from resulting plagues and famines regarding, related to the Bar Kokhba result, revolt. You understand that? Probably 2 or 3 million people died directly or indirectly because of this. So details are important. Believing the Bible over traditions of men is very important. Their highly respected rabbis were wrong. And those who don't accept Jesus as the Messiah are wrong today. Yet because one of their greatest sages tried to make others believe that uh, Bar Kokhba was really the Messiah, many Jews have still hung on, clung to this wrong calculation of the age of the earth and the world. And you can prove from Jewish writings that uh, the uh, Jews changed their date. I'm not going to go to all this, but if you go to the Antiquities of the Jews, written by Josephus, book 12, chapter 7, verse 6, he talks about various, this Olympiad, and, it, and says, uh, the, well, let me just go back. It says, uh, the 25th of the month of Apollines, on the 148th year, and on the 154th Olympiad. And this desolation came to pass according to the prophecy of Daniel, which was given 408 years before, where he declared that the Macedonians would dissolve that worship for some time. So what Josephus is basically doing is pointing to the destruction of Jerusalem, of the temple, tying it in with the prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. Well, I think Josephus has a few issues with some of his numbers and dates. Let me comment that this differs from the Sidar Olam, the essentially official book, if you will, that Jews use for what year they come up with. And this is one reason why Jews don't want to accept everything from Josephus, because it, again, says their account is wrong, but it is wrong. But even Jewish scholars know this. Here's from a Jewish scholar named Schluman. Josephus is working from a different chronology than Cedar Olam, and that is correct. The Cedar Olam has it uh, wrong, and if you put this all together, you find out again the timing for Daniel 9 points to Jesus. There seems to have been a deliberate intent to deceive people about Jesus, and a deliberate attempt to then change it not only the fact that probably a couple million Jews got killed from 130 to 140 uh, A.D. from from the fighting and from the famine and the plagues, of whatever that happened afterwards. Not only that, but throughout history, Jews have been relying on this false date so they don't have to accept Daniel 9 pointing to Jesus. But even if they ignored the date for a moment, again, the temple was destroyed. The Bible says, the Old Testament says that the Messiah would come before the temple was destroyed. That should be pretty clear. Yet, people don't accept it. Now, let's go to Amos chapter 2. There's 
we've got deceit from Jewish leaders and Jewish scholars. But you know what? That seems to have been prophesied as well. Amos 2, verse 4, from the Jewish Publication Society. And their lies have caused them to err, after which their fathers did walk. Their fathers followed other fathers, etc. I'm going to read this. That was from the Jewish Publication Society. Now I'm going to read the same thing from the complete Jewish Bible. Amos 2, 4, or at least that translation. Their lies caused them to fall into error, and live the way their ancestors did. False traditions have neg negatively affected the Jews, as well as most who claim Christianity. Now, yet, irrespective of why this may have happened, the fact is that the Jewish year is off by just over 200 years compared to historical records and the biblical account. If more people knew the truth, they'd take another look at Jesus. No other figure... No other Jewish figure during Jesus' time could have been the Messiah. Oh yeah, there were false messiahs that rose up, and the Jews correctly considered them to be false. But calling Jesus false is an error. If Jews believed the book of Daniel, somebody had to have been the Messiah at the time Jesus rose up, started his ministry, etc. Jesus is the uh, prophesied Messiah. Now, a big problem that Jews have modern Jews, is a heavy reliance in post-biblical traditions like the Babylonian Talmud and the Cedar Olim. Those, uh, the Jews act like they're as important as Scripture or almost as important. Now let's go to Isaiah chapter 29. I'm going to read this starting in verse 13 from the Jewish Publication Society translation. The accepting tradition over the word of God is something that God prophesied the Jews would do. Isaiah 29, verse 13. And the Lord said, For as much as his people draw near, and with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but they have removed their heart far from me, and their fear of me is, is a commandment of men learned by rote. You know, memorizing stuff from the Talmud or whatever. Therefore, behold, I will... Again, do a marvelous work among his people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. And the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the prudence of prudent men shall be hid. Woe to them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works that are in the dark. And they say, who sees us? Who knows us? While Isaiah is talking on the wrong reliance of tradition, verse 15 really reminds me of what happened with the cedar olem. And those who rely on Jewish tradition above the Bible will not accept Jesus as Messiah. Now, even in Jesus' time, you can read about this in Matthew 15, verses 7 to 9, Jesus warned that the Jews were relying on tradition of men more than the Bible. And it was Jews relying upon their hope for militaristic Messiah uh, that is having them rely on the wrong thing. Now, we're still seeing various things happen with Jews. Now, these are some of the things I'm going to read now are from some fringe groups. So this is one from 2018. Messiah mania has reached a fever pitch in Israel. Perhaps the most surprising development is a statement by a well-respected Israeli rabbi, Shaim Kanevevsky, a leading authority in Herede Jewish society, not sure if I'm saying these, pronouncing these right, stating unequivocally that the Messiah was born July 21st, 2018. A Jewish language religious news site explained the rabbi based his statement on the Jewish Talmud, Trachet, Brachot, and Mishnah Rabbah, a collection of homiletic teachings compiled in the 5th century, Tiberius, which states that the Messiah will be born on Tisha B'Av, which is also observed the fast day, fast day, mourning the destruction of the Jewish temples. So, anyone who thinks that Jesus was born, or excuse me, the Messiah was born on uh, July 21st, 2018, is not going to accept Jesus as the Messiah. And there's another one. There's a Kabbalistic uh, mystic, if you will, Jewish rabbi by the name of Dov Cook. He made a startling announcement. He announced that he had a vision of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yoki, a Jewish sage from the second century, known by the acronym Rashbi, who according to tradition wrote the Zohar, blah, 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 blah. Kind of reminds me of a certain 
uh, people who say they've seen Mary or something, or others. Anyway, and basically he's talking about something to do with rain. He says there are many ways to understand the Talmud, literally and figuratively, but it's clear is that rain is an aspect of God's mercy, and as such necessarily precedes the Messiah. So basically this is from 2018. They said certain rains that they had in Jerusalem means the Messiah is about to come. And that's based on their tradition. I don't believe that's correct or biblical. On the other hand, there's another one from 2016. It says the drying up of the Kinneret has clear messianic interpretations. The Talmud in Sanhedrin 97a discusses the signs that will appear just prior to the coming of the son of David. And actually I read some of those before. Rabbi Yehuda, a Talmudic sage, states that one of the signs presaging the Messiah will be that the great Sea of Galilee and Gablan, the upper Jordan River, and the Golan will become desolate and destroyed, etc., uh, etc. Et it says a simple reading of the prophecy in the Talmud is these things are going to be destroyed. But again, the Talmud is Jewish tradition. We need to believe the Word of God above Jewish tradition. Now, lest I give a wrong impression, understand today you've got Protestants, Catholics, and others who believe Jesus is going to come a certain time or whatever based on all kinds of things that are not from the Bible as well. So it's not just Jews who are looking for the wrong time for the Messiah or the end of the world or whatever. Uh, many who profess Christ, the same thing. Now, I've been talking about Daniel 9, I've been talking about Jews, I've been talking about Jesus. I want to talk a little bit about uh, Jesus and the Jews for just a moment. Because of how many people practice what is called Christianity, uh, a lot of people have concluded that Jesus and, uh, and real Christians are anti-Jewish. But that's not the case. Although people like the Roman Emperor Constantine, Orthodox Bishop uh, uh, John Chrysostom, and a prominent uh, Protestant reformer Martin Luther were quite anti-Jewish. Jesus certainly was not. Yet, because many uh, who claim Jesus have been anti-Semitic, this has influenced how Jews perceive what they think Christianity is. Now, in the 17th century, there was a Jew by the name of Orobio de Castro. He concluded, as far as he could see, the Christian Messiah did not change people to the point where they loved their neighbor any better than, than they could previously, and they were full of pride. Here's something that he wrote. And I, I have a book called The Jewish-Christian Argument, where you have uh, churchianity versus Judaism. Lack of a better term. Anyway, here's what this Jewish writer wrote. The Christians must appear more redeemed if I am to believe in their redemption. In place of redemption, we see war, superstition, idolatry, and sectarianism ruling the earth more than ever before. No Christian lives by the Sermon on the Mount. Now, sadly, it looks like um, Oribe de Castro did not know real Christians. Now, basically, his arguments have been raised by other voices in Judaism throughout history. Many Jews see Christianity as a form of paganism. Now, informed scholars realized early Christians did not participate in carnal warfare. They did not have superstitions in the Middle Ages. They didn't have idols or icons, nor did they endorse paganism, nor were they intent on ruling in this age. But before I go any further, well, we have another book containing a history of the Church of God. It's also available at the ccog.org website, and it's also free. And this will give you more history about what early Christians believed. Not counting uh, scriptures, this book has over 300 historical references, most of which would be accepted by Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, or Roman Catholic, or Protestant scholars. It helped document what the true Church of God has believed throughout history, as well as early Christian teachings, which were not like what the Jews have running into. As far as trying to rule the world now, another book called The Gospel of the Kingdom of God. Christians were not intent on coming up with a militaristic system to take over the world in this age but to proclaim the good news that Jesus is going to return and establish the kingdom of God on this earth. This book is also available at the ccog.org website. But, if you go down on that site further, if you keep going down, you'll see a list of languages, around 90 to 100 languages. This book has been translated in, so if you find the language you prefer, click on there and you can read that in it.
your language, your preferred language as well, hopefully. We don't have all languages, that's why I say hopefully, but we've got about a hundred of them there. Okay. Now the other thing is, to this day, I should comment that there are Christians who contend for the original faith. When they don't persecute, uh, and they don't consider that, that, uh, that those who kill Jews to be actual Christians. Murderous persecutors do not meet the definition of being Christian. You can look in Romans 8 9, for example. Plus, as I mentioned before, true Christians are looking for not the dom dom domination of this age, but for the kingdom of God. Real Christianity transforms lives. Now, I'll admit that no Christian is perfect by the Sermon on Mount standards, but the be changes in behavior should and do distinguish real Christians from others. And we've got a book on that. Let's see if I can find this one to help you. You haven't read this. Christians, Ambassadors for the Kingdom of God. Helps you learn more how to live as a Christian. This one tells you a bit more about certain Christian beliefs uh, throughout history. And this one is a Christian belief throughout history, but more focused on how to live as a Christian. This is a bit more focused on history. And again, these all are available at the ccog.org website. Anyway, by and large, Jews don't accept the, or can't accept the practices and teachings of modern-day Christianity because these don't agree with important teachings from the Old Testament. Now, I'd like to read something from the Jewish Encyclopedia, which would be different than you might think, because they're actually more open than some think on some points. This is about Jesus' teaching about the spirit of the law. This is Jewish interpretation. Jewish Encyclopedia. The Jewish Encyclopedia Interpretation of Jesus' Teaching on the Spirit of the Law. Nothing in all this insistence upon the Spirit of the Law, rather than on the halakhic development of it, was necessarily or essentially anti-Jewish. So Jewish Encyclopedia people said, look, we looked at this and Jesus wasn't really teaching things that really that anti-Jewish. Furthermore, to ascribe asking him in the spirit of Hillel, Hillel, to what single commandment the whole law should be reduced, he quoted the doctrine of the Didache, which gives two chief commandments as the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 4, thou shalt, uh, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, uh, Leviticus uh, 23, 19, excuse me, 28, 19, no, excuse me, I'm sorry, this is Roman numerals, excuse me a second, Roman 18, 19, sorry, Leviticus 18, 19. Thus declaring the essential solidarity with his own views with those of the Old Testament and current Judaism. So in other words, Jesus Encyclopedia says, Jesus said, taught what the Jews should have been teaching then. Now what people sometimes, particularly in a Protestant world, don't realize is that uh, early Christians did keep the law of God, which meant they kept the Ten Commandments. Okay? There's no doubt that early Christians advocated you're supposed to keep the Ten Commandments. If you're in a religion or your leaders say you do not need the Ten Commandments, they're not practicing biblical Christianity. Now, you might be in a group that claims to keep the Ten Commandments and violates them, similarly to the time of Jesus where the Pharisees claimed to keep the Ten Commandments and violate them. Anyway, we discuss all this in great, in fair, detail, fair amount of detail in this free book about the Ten Commandments, which is also available at the ccg.org website. Early Christians were not anti-Jewish, and they had a lot of practices in common with, with the Jews, uh, more than the majority who profess Christ have now. Now, the Apostle Peter warned that there would be leaders who falsely claim Christianity would, and that they would cause the way of truth to be blasphemed in 2 Peter 2, verse 2. So one of the reasons I believe that Jews don't accept Christianity is because they're leaders who they think are Christian, who are teaching things that are vehemently opposed to by the Old Testament, and the Jews are like, this doesn't make any sense. The problem is that those who practice or are preaching a false Christianity or a false gospel. Now, early Christians actually kept the holy days listed in Leviticus 23, as do practicing Jews uh, and those in the continuing Church of God today. As a matter of fact, let's see if I can find this one here. I think I have one to show another booklet. Nope. I think if I can grab it. Maybe I didn't pull it. Oh, yeah, here it is. 
Should you keep God's holy days or demonic holidays? Early Christians kept God's holy days. People call these Jewish, but the reality is, the reality of this is they were given by God. Uh, you can start see, seeing Genesis chapter 1 on that God's plan included the biblical holy days. So I should also comment that a lot of what you would call mainstream uh, Christianity, they misunderstand a lot of aspects of prophecy, and the Jews consider these reasons not to accept Jesus. I'd like to read uh, something from uh, the Jewish Christian argument. This is a Jewish view related to prophecy. In the verse in which Joel has God say, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on, my, on account of my people and my heritage, Israel. At the resurrection of the dead, the general judgment on the last day. Actually, that's from eschatology from the Jewish library. I'm sorry, this part will be from the Jewish Christian argument. The year 70 constitutes a sesura in the sense that after that, apocalyptic restoration is awaited concretely. Henceforth, we are compelled no longer to hope for individual reconciliation, for individual apostasy, but only the great reconciliation of the last day. What's this got to do with anything? While we in the Continuing Church of God believe that there were prophets and prophecies after uh, 70 A.D., because the book of Revelation, for example, is probably written around 90-95 A.D., we agree that there will be judgment what could be called the Great Reconciliation at the Last Day. Now, interestingly, even some Jewish sages understood this. There was a Jewish sage by the name of Maya Monid. Monides, and I know I'm saying that, I'm going to spell his name because I can never get his name right. M-A-I-M-O-N-I-D-E-S, and I know if you're Jewish you can probably just roll it off the tip of your tongue easily. Here's something he wrote to his pupil, Haste Aha Levi. In regard to your question concerning the Gentile nations, you should know that God demands the heart, and it matters how to be judged according to the intent of the heart. There is therefore no doubt that every that everyone from among the Gentiles who brings his soul to perfection through virtues and wisdom and the knowledge of God has a share in eternal blessedness. Now, while we in the continuing church of God believe that everyone must accept Jesus for salvation, as it says in Acts ten verses uh, four excuse me, Acts four verses ten through twelve, we believe that those whose minds have been blinded in this age, both the Jews and the Gentiles, will have an opportunity for salvation uh, later. Uh, we've got a couple of online books. One is called Is God Calling You? The other one is Universal Offer of Salvation. So what am I trying to say with this as far as Daniel 9 and the Jews and all the rest? First of all, if there's any conflict between tradition and scripture, believe the Bible. Okay, As it says in the New Testament, let God be true and all men a liar. The Bible prophesied in Amos that the Jews or others would follow those who didn't always tell the truth. The reality is the Cedar Olam, in terms of its being the right date, the right year, is wrong. It was changed. It was wrong. Numerous Jewish scholars have admitted it. Many understand it was wrong intentionally to point to a false Messiah. Simon Bar Kokhba, which Rabbi Akiva thought was the right guy. But by following his tradition and his false calculations, probably two million Jews ended up dying. If instead we rely on the true calculations, you could prove that Jesus came when the Messiah was supposed to come. And where, while you might have an argument where there's a 360 year, 360 day year, 365 and a quarter year days, day year and all that kind of stuff, Skip all that for a moment. The prophecy in Daniel 9 says the Messiah is going to come before the temple was destroyed. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD. There's no doubt about that. If you're Jewish and you've been following traditions that have give you, given you the wrong idea about Jesus, again, study your scriptures. We also would recommend you study our free book, Proof Jesus is the Messiah, which is available at the ccog.org website. And if you're, even if you're not Jewish, you're not sure about Jesus being Messiah, again, through the Bible, through prophecy, through history, 
this is something that you can prove if you're willing to accept the truth. Jesus was the Messiah. He came when he was supposed to come. Daniel 9, 27 was one of the prophecies that pointed to Jesus being the Messiah. And Jesus was the Messiah. And still can be your Savior today. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God.